Welcome to Provincial Vote 2024. I'm your host, Neil Godbu. I'm the Executive Director of the Prince George Chamber of Commerce. We have with us three candidates from the riding of Prince George North Caribou. We have Randy Thompson from the BC Greens, Coralie Oakes, who's the independent candidate, and we have Sheldon Clare from the BC Conservatives. Welcome to all of you. Let's get right into it. Sheldon, I'll ask a first question to you. Sure. In 2021, CKPG reported your comments as president of the National Firearms Association when you said, I had a call from a person today who suggested revisiting our old woodworking and metalworking skills and construct guillotines again. And you were censored by the National Security and Public Safety Committee as a result. So with serious threats these days against politicians of all stripes, what are you and the BC Conservatives doing to turn down this kind of rhetoric? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I think it's important to understand the context of that particular comment. I was relating an anecdote that was related to me, which articulated the anger that people were feeling about some of the decisions made by the federal government. And I can assure you when we've been knocking on doors, we're hearing an awful lot of people who are very angry with the provincial government nowadays. And I think it's important for us as a party in the Conservative Party of British Columbia to be paying close attention to people and listen to them and to understand why they are angry about the various issues that have caused them to change their political views. I mean, we've had people who told me they were lifelong NDP supporters, they were, they'd always voted Liberal, and now they're going to vote for me and the Conservative Party of BC. And they're saying this and they're doing this because they've had enough. They are really fed up with the direction the province has been going and they want change. And I'm one of those who's representing change. But my question was about turning down the rhetoric and, and, and that anger. Well, I think the anger gets turned down when people start to see results. And I think there are a lot of issues in, in Prince George North Caribou where people want to see results. They want the Quinell interconnector built. They're looking at crumbling infrastructure all over the place. I have many people complain to me about roads and bridges and, and how their hospital isn't serving their function, how they can't get doctors. I think people have a right to be annoyed and angry and to articulate that to people who they hope to represent them. Right. Coralie, if you've been in provincial politics now for, for 11 years already. Um, what are you seeing out there in terms of that anger and, and, and how do we turn that down into a more civil discourse like this conversation today? Yeah, well, thank you for the question. I, I think having the opportunity this election to be an independent provides a really important uh, opportunity to have honest conversations with people. I think we have certainly seen uh, polarization and rhetoric that I personally think is dangerous. Uh, I spend a lot of time uh, working with students. Uh, I've been so fortunate to serve as the shadow minister for post-secondary education and to encourage young people to get engaged and to get involved and I think language matters uh, and I think that we each have an obligation um, to make sure that we're good role models and that we are uh, encouraging people to get engaged and to get involved, so that's really important. But I also think it's an opportunity for me to get out and listen to people. I'm not, uh, you know, we're not muzzled by party lines anymore and we can go out and we can seek the best solution for people. We can listen, we can engage, and we can bring that forward and I'm really excited about that opportunity. Randy, your perspective on this issue. One of the principles of the Green Party, the BC Green Party, is nonviolence. So trying to stir up anger and opposition, is it goes against the principle that we are all the same. We're all in the same boat together. I like that here you have the all-gender washroom, because really, have you ever gone to somebody's house and seen the men's washroom and the women's is down the hall? We're all the same. We're, we're all, we have different views. Politically, views are beliefs, just like a religion, so that you might have a particular belief system and you might be very strong. It doesn't mean it's based in reality. It means you believe it. So I can respect somebody's beliefs, but I've had people, I've, I've been writing a lot on, I write a lot on Facebook anyway, I, and I posted something the other day and somebody commented back, you should pull out of the election and let 
um, you're going to split the vote and you're going to you have two parties that have the right to battle it out. And I commented back, you know, like Coralie is an independent. If we get an NDP, there'll be four people in the riding. Um, the vote's going to get split. The vote gets split anyway. It always gets split. That's part of an election. But it, it, I, and he goes, I see your point. And then we had a couple of comments. And at the end of it all, I explained what the Green Party really stood for and what I felt the Conservatives are more um, resource-based and the NDP has sort of lost their way. They used to be more like the Greens. And at the end, I said, I hope you have a great day. And he goes, a great day to you too, sir. And it's sort of like taking somebody who comes at you as like an enemy and just go like, this is what I believe. This is what I think. This is what I believe in. And you don't have to, but you don't have to make me your enemy. Right. You know? This segues into our second question. This one is for you, Coralie. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why should voters support you as an independent candidate, knowing that independent MLAs struggle to have their voices heard in the legislature to advocate on behalf of their constituents? It's a great question. So the first thing I think experience is really going to matter this election. And I, you know, I've had the privilege of serving as a minister of community sport and cultural development. I've served as the minister responsible for small business and the minister responsible for reducing red tape, all of which is going to be critical to moving this next parliament forward. I've also had the opportunity to serve in opposition, and that's not as much fun, but equally as important and very important for accountability. I've learned how to make sure our voice gets heard in the legislature. I have a very strong understanding of the standing orders, the Legislative Assembly, how things work. I've sat on numerous select standing committees. Now, all of this for people at home are thinking, well, how does that actually move our voice forward? I've been able to articulate and move uh, many, many projects forward, whether it was in government or opposition. And I'm very confident that I will be able to deliver your voice in a concise uh, manner uh, as an independent. Look, we've been able to deliver major uh, infrastructure projects to our region, and I know that and am confident that I'll be able to do that as an independent. Randy, how would you make your voice heard in the legislature? It's funny, I've been thinking about it because I'm, I'm, I'm not a politician, I'm just a guy. And I'm, I stand up and I say what I believe in, and, and I don't hold back, there's so much double speak and flip flopping and, and I think that a lot of that is what people don't like about politics is you say one thing and then you do something else and you don't really stand up. And I'm just gonna I'm not gonna go, please sir, may I speak? You know, I'm just gonna say what I wanna say. And if you don't like it, that's fine, but I'm gonna bring the truth to whatever I'm gonna say. So I'm gonna I part of my belief in what I'm doing in this election is battling the myths of politics and forestry and what the Green Party is, because a lot of people think the Green Party is a bunch of softy weaklings that are just tree-hugging hippies, and that's not true at all. Um, but that's the belief that people have. So I want to stand up and just speak the truth, and whether people like it or not, that's up to them. Sheldon, your views. Well, I think anyone who puts their name on a ballot is worthy of some respect. As I've uh, noticed this particular last year, it's an awful lot of work, it's a lot of travel, and it's a lot of listening. Uh, we've knocked on some 1,800 doors, we've made some 25,000 phone calls, we've engaged with an awful lot of people to hear what they are thinking and where they are at. And I see it as my role to be their voice and to be the voice of all the constituents in this riding when they have a concern. The primary job of an MLA is to help people and I've been helping people my whole life. I've uh, been a post-secondary educator for 31 years, a historian and English instructor. I've been involved with uh, several community events. I'm chairman of our local branch of the Royal Canadian Legion in Prince George and I've uh, been quite involved in listening and helping and working with people. And I believe that I have a lot to offer and I'm quite prepared to serve if the people choose me to be their servant. Thank you, Sheldon. I appreciate your response. We'll be right back after this short break with more questions for our candidates.
Welcome back to Provincial Vote 2024. Our next question is for you, Randy. Although violent crime has declined in the past six years, public safety is a huge issue. What policy changes would you and your party introduce to make residents feel safer in Prince George, North Caribou? There's one thing that's been brought up, um, released recently by Sonia First now is the Dogwood model of doing health care. And that's like clinics, because so many people don't have a doctor. I don't have a doctor. My family lost our doctor. And part of the, the, it's not the same thing as what you're saying, but part of the reason there's crime is because people are addicted. They don't have proper health care. They're in very many different states of unrest. And when people are committing crimes and they become part of the, the justice system, whether it's justice or not, the criminal system, um, you don't have the resources to say, okay, this is where you need to go. We assess this person. We figure out what's wrong. We, why, did, why are they doing what they're doing? Are they taking their meds? Because a lot of the crime is based on mental health and addiction. And you see it. You see it in downtown Prince George. You see it in Quinell. You see it in every city. That there's homeless people that don't have enough money to survive. So getting the services that are needed for those people and treating them with compassion and respect and showing them that they're worth taking some time, the response will be different for everybody because they're, they're messed up for different reasons. So everybody's got a story. But we need to start addressing the services that are required. Sheldon, your views on public safety. Well, that's certainly an issue that comes up when we're listening to people at the doors. And I, I, I think my colleague has made some very good points on that. However, public safety is a very complex issue because it has a number of facets to it. One of them is economic opportunity. Another is mental health, addiction crisis, which have relations there. I spent some time with uh, one of the local psychiatrists, Dr. Kane, discussing uh, her views and solutions for these problems. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Kane and her colleague Dr. McLeod pointed out to a few of us who were there was that we have a really serious need for long-term forensic psychiatric care facilities in the north, but not just in the north, in the whole province. When they closed Riverview, an awful lot of people were just released out there without the supports and treatments necessary for them to become productive citizens. And, to, and some of them just can't be treated. So we really are in need of places that do not displace people from healthcare facilities for other purposes, like surgery wait times and so on, are being hit by the, this crisis, and the violence that comes along with some aspects of this. Not everyone with a mental health problem is violent. That's absolutely clear. And not everyone with a mental health problem is a danger to themselves or anyone else. However, we do have some serious problems with people who do need a little bit of the compassion that government can bring to bear to make sure they're properly treated and properly assisted in their journey. Corley. Sure, well, policy matters. And I think what we've experienced is um, some challenges with the decriminalization policy. I'm gonna put my Chamber of Commerce hat on. Of course, I spent 14 years uh, with the, working with the Chamber of Commerce. And something that really uh, I think is important to highlight um, here is the impacts of what is happening in community. And you know when 86% have seen uh, increase in uh, uh, mental health challenges in our communities, we need to take that serious. 82% of employees are feeling the struggle right now of violence and aggression and mental health in our communities, right here, right now. This morning I got up and I looked at where somebody could go for help. As an MLA, we are often, all of us, will be in a position where you will get those phone calls from those family members who are desperately trying to seek help for their loved ones. Of the two um, uh, uh, First Nations Health Authority uh, facilities that do uh, medical um, supports for detox, there is a waiting list. I looked at how people get treatment in this region, and there is no place to go. Our services are so lacking, so first, Education is important to understand what the challenges are on the ground. We have a significant issue, but where are the services? And we deserve the same services up here in our communities at, that are available down in the Lower Mainland. Thank you, Coralie. Next question is for you, Sheldon. Sounds great, thank you. <laughs> the BC Conservative Party platform says 
universities and colleges that do not support and defend freedom, freedom of expression on campus will be defunded. Taxpayer money will not be used to support places of censorship and intimidation. You mentioned you're a longtime uh, instructor uh, at, at the College of New Caledonia. I'll, I'll qualify that. Please give us some examples then of how you have been censored on campus. <laughs> well, personally, I could probably give you a list of that, but I'd rather not get into my personal situations about such things because I don't think that's necessary to address the particular issue. I think that what is important in academia is academic freedom, the ability to think and examine issues critically, and to operate a forum where students are free to come forward, express their views, have them held up to scrutiny, and have uh, legitimate criticism brought to bear. And that's the same for instructors. And when we, you have a policy, or you have long-term ideological policies in colleges and universities that limit that academic freedom and cause it to be put through a lens of political philosophy and ideology rather than critical examination of issues, critical thinking, and just good old-fashioned debate and discussion, well, then you have a problem. And in my view, we have been seeing a deterioration in that ability to do critical examination of issues and to seek excellence and merit in the academy. And so, I think that when you have a long-time ideological problem in the colleges and universities, it's very important to push back, dial that back, and get it to an equilibrium where people can go and be the best they can be, learn from the very best, and discuss, dispute, and argue in a free environment. I, I, I bring this conversation up partly because I, to have a broader discussion about post-secondary education in general. And it needs it. In, in, in terms of, uh, of how is post-secondary and is post-secondary education serving us and particularly the constituents of, of your writing. Coralie, you've been the shadow minister with BC United for post-secondary education. I'll start with you, Sheldon, I will come back with, to you on that broader topic in the end. Coralie, you start. Yeah, I started my career, um, my first election at 20, because of the passion for post-secondary education, specifically in the North. We have to have access um, for our students. Um, you know, when I graduated, we didn't have the ability to uh, go to post-secondary here. I am incredibly concerned about the challenges at both the federal and provincial level. I've talked for two years about the funding review and the impact that that is going to have. It's going to hit in January and we're going to see significant operational challenges in post-secondary institutions across this province, particularly um, impacting smaller campuses like ours uh, in Prince George and in Quesnel and throughout the region. And I think it is something that I hope we can get more attention to. The other challenge that I've raised multiple times uh, throughout the past few years is most other provinces have an adjustment grant uh, for post-secondary institutions that exist uh, in um, smaller, more rural, less uh, uh, populated areas. I think we need to put that forward because at the end of the day, um, if you look at a community, for example, like Quenelle, if we did not have our campus, we would not have our nurses to keep that hospital open. It is critically important important post-secondary needs to be on the uh, question on the ballot just um, this election cycle and we need to be paying attention. Randy. Um, I grew up in Richmond. I grew up in the lower mainland in Vancouver. Um, I went from high school to cooking school from one beginning of the summer to the beginning of the fall. I spent um, BC Vocational, we did our cook training. And I cooked around the province for, for many years. It was one of the jobs I'd done. I've also uh, been a radio announcer and, and have uh, worked in the film industry as an actor and background. I've done a lot of different things. But you need training to do that. And you want to not allow youth coming out of post-secondary some time to just fool around. You know, like, it's, it, it can be nice to take a break, but it's also good to take that discipline of school and move it into a vocation of some kind. We need the trades, we need all kinds of things. The trouble with Quinell is we're an hour and a half in either direction. You can't commute to school in going to Williams Lake or Prince George if you live in Quinell. So you'd have to either live here 
And so we need a, a, a bigger base of alternatives for children, children, youth, teens, moving out of the house or out of school into an actual career. We'll be right back with more questions. Welcome back to Provincial Vote 2024. Next question is for you, Coralie. You served in the BC United Caucus for nine years with John Rustad, mm -hmm. now the leader of the BC Conservatives. After Kevin Falcon removed BC United from this campaign, did you speak to John about replacing Sheldon as a candidate for the BC Conservatives and Prince George Caribou? And if not, why not? Sure. Well, the first thing I'll say, I've known John and his family for a long time, and I respect John, uh, you know, as somebody who ha has represented the North. There are particular challenges, and I think it doesn't matter what party I think you often represent. When you live in some of our more rural uh, ridings, you spent a lot of time traveling. Uh, Sheldon talked a little bit about that, and you get to know people uh, personally, and um, so that's the first thing. Uh, I didn't get a call. Um, shocking uh, that I didn't, um, but look, I, you know, when, when this all happened, I was very hopeful that there would be an opportunity to really build a broad-based free enterprise party. I've spent my entire uh, career, in fact, I started getting into politics at 16 as one of those uh, young, keen individuals on a, you know, on a, in school, and I think that there is a strong need in British Columbia for um, a free enterprise, uh, big tent party. Uh, I am confident now as an independent that I will be able to bring that voice. I believe this is going to be an incredibly close election. And I believe that the independents that are very experienced, uh, professional, have the ability to bring the balance of power and able to move parliament forward this next, uh, this next parliament. And I'm excited about that opportunity. Sheldon, we just found out from, from Coralie that, as she mentioned, she didn't get the call, meaning that you were chosen over an incumbent MLA with 11 years experience. Why do you think that is? Well, I'm a member of the Conservative Party of BC and Coralie is not. That's the, probably the first part of it. I, I, and I've got to say, I was very surprised at how rapidly things unfolded around Kevin Falcon's decision to fold up his his you know, decreasing tent and, and go away. And I did talk to Coralie briefly about that when I saw her at the powwow, uh, the Taco Diné. Uh, that seems like just a few days ago. And yeah, I, 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 was, I feel quite sympathetic and empathic about that. However, I had no expectation that she would be chosen over me for that particular role because we are fundamentally different. We, we do represent different philosophies. We do are diff coming from a different perspective and party. And I think relationships within the, the political process that pre-dated my involvement in this probably played a role in that. And it's, it's interesting for me to hear Randy talk about the Greens and, and all this. And I, I really respect a lot of the things you guys have to say. And I think there it's an important voice to be having heard. But I would point out that Mr. Weaver, who is the leader of the Green Party, has endorsed the Conservative Party of British Columbia because of our big tent approach to things. And John Rust had to said that to me over and over again. Big tent, Sheldon, big tent. We're a big tent party and we have a lot of different views, but we are going to change things. They're not going to be the same as they have been. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Coralie, but you represent lack of change and that's probably the reason that that didn't happen and I, I do feel badly because I, I thought to myself I was looking forward to seeing that party engage with the BC the Conservative Party of BC so we could highlight those differences in a much more vocal and vigorous way. I want to give both candidates both Randy and Coralie a, a chance to respond to what you just said. Coralie you first. 
Well, I think that actually I represent the most change uh, for British Columbians and for this particular riding. The fact to have an independent voice in this parliament that has experience both at the local government level and as a cabinet minister and as somebody that has been a fierce defender of, of the voices from this area provides an excellent opportunity. And yes, I am a moderate. Um, I am a fiscal conservative, but I have a social conscience, and I think that matters. And I think that ensuring that we have an inclusive society, one that where we support people, one where we lift people up, I think is important. And I'm proud to be able to get out and talk to people and to represent an independent in this election. Randy, last word to you on this topic. As far as Andrew Weaver is concerned, I will say what I have to say is that I have nothing to say about Andrew Weaver. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, I th think that the change that comes from within the green is really about truth and respect. It's, it puts everything aside that's like not that important and getting to some core values. And that's what's missing in politics, and that's what I hope to bring, a respect for some core values of, of just truth and honesty and taking off the propaganda glasses and just seeing things for what they really are. Thank you, Randy. My next question is to you, so I'll keep you on the hot seat. The BC Greens have committed to halting all future investments in fossil fuel infrastructure in BC which would include all new LNG projects and the Prince Rupert gas transmission pipeline. Would that also include the proposed Sunrise expansion project, which would run right through your riding, which Enbridge contends is essential to meet the growing needs for gas and power in BC? As far as your last point, I don't know exactly the details of that. Um, I do know that we are trying to move away from fossil fuel. I know, yes, everyone's driving a car and EVs are coming. We're going to be doing an energy transition forum as well. Um, there is a move. A lot of people complain about electricity and EVs and batteries, and that's a different discussion. But no, from a child's perspective, when I was younger, I knew that we needed to stop pumping gas out of the, and oil out of the ground because the sun gives us energy every day. Though as a kid, I'm going like, why don't we just use some solar energy? I mean, there's problems with it, but there is new technology coming up in the, in the green or non-fossil fuel energy sector that can have great benefits to us and not have to pump stuff out of the ground because it's just toxic no matter which way you look at it. So the movement is towards moving away from fossil fuel. So to stop all new infrastructure says, okay, we're serious about it. You know, I think that's the point. Sheldon, your comments. Well, as much as I respect a clean environment, I would, I mean, I'm a mountaineer, ice climber, I love to get outside and hike and hunt and fish and all of that. I also understand that the most resource dependent community in this entire province is Vancouver and the Lower Mainland. And they are very much dependent upon the fossil fuels that we extract and use. The idea that we would be getting rid of LNG, which is a plentiful, cheap and readily available resource is in my mind completely ridiculous. We need to make sure that we are properly making British Columbia a place that everyone has the ability to make use of recreate in, enjoy, and prosper economically in as well. Uh, the Green Party plan, well, well, well intentioned of course, is something that would doom British Columbia to economic disaster. It's simply not feasible. We had really good presentations from uh, some of the energy companies and they were very clear in articulating the needs that people are going to see with using things like electronic vehicles and the load on the power grid. And hydro just isn't going to cut it. Solar power is not going to cut it. And we are going to be forced to look at some very difficult conversations about how we can make things work. And gas and oil have to be part of those conversations. Corley, what do you think? Yeah. One of the things I think we don't spend enough time talking about is how um, the fossil fuel sector has really driven a lot of innovation and technology, as have all the natural resource sectors. When you look at, for example, the, the um, critical mineral strategy, when you look at what is happening in forestry, when you look at what is happening with LNG, it, we have really seen 
um, innovation and technology develop. And I think that that is going to be our future. And again, going back, if I can, to investing in people and investing in post-secondary and making sure that we, we understand that there is a very strong need to drive innovation, to drive research. That'll increase affordability, that'll increase profitability in, in um, our province and in Canada, and at the same time, help address some of the most critical challenges that we have with climate. Thank you, Coralie, for your response. We'll be right back with more questions for our candidates. Welcome back to Provincial Vote 2024. Next question is for Sheldon. For years, the Cornell Chamber of Commerce has been trying to convince the provincial government to invest, and I think you brought this up earlier, in the Cornell North-South Interconnector, which would improve the flow of Highway 97 traffic through Cornell, particularly for commercial trucks now having to drive on that aging Cornell River Bridge and straight into downtown. And by the way, I really should credit the Cornell Chamber of Commerce with, uh, with uh, making sure I ask this question. If elected, when can voters expect you and a John Rustad government to deliver on this essential project? Well, my pledge to the voters in Prince George, North Caribou, is that I'm going to push for that relentlessly. When I brought John Rustad to Quinell on July 5th, one of the things I was able to bring up and speak relatively knowledgeably on was the Quinell interconnector. I have been to all of the bridges around Quinell. I've gone underneath them. I've taken pictures of them. I have them on my phone. And I've looked at the crumbling structure. I've looked at the rusty metal. I've looked at the pieces falling off the bridges. I was privileged to be able to talk to Bob Sutton from ENCOM, who was doing a bridge inspection on the Quinell River Bridge while I was having a look at it. And he told me, he says, be careful what you're looking at here. You might not like what you see. And it occurred to me that this is a problem that has been going on for 50 years. When I looked at the plaque on the Quinell River Bridge, that says it was built by flying Phil Gallardi and Ben Ginter in 1961, it said to me, it's time that we get this done. It's a two-lane bridge over one of the most important arterial roads in the entire province. It's going to be a disaster someday, and we have to fix this. The bridges themselves need replacing. They're, they're all in a terrible, the Johnson Bridge, I mean, my gosh, it, 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 pieces are falling off of it while, while people walk on it, it's terrible. So the Quinell Interconnector for me is a priority, and if I get nothing else done, I'm sure I'll be very, very popular with most people in Quinell. I know there are some that are very uncomfortable with the prospect of their homes being uh, taken away or, or being, uh, being bought out to build that. And I, I, it's, I have a great deal of sympathy for that. It's, it's, a, it's part of the process, so to make sure that that's done in a fair and respectful way. And I mean, there's an awful lot of interesting infrastructure problems that are going on in some of those hills and slopes around Quinell that I got a big earful from people, especially in some of the high ground where their houses are sliding down the hill. And I know that uh, my colleagues have certainly heard about these as well. So get it done. That's what I think. It's been 50 years. It's time to quit talking. It's time to put the pressure on. And I know I got the biggest round of applause when I committed to do that at our meeting on, on July 5th. Coralie. Yeah, well, this project goes back to Alex Fraser. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I think um, why this project is critically important is it's not just about a north-south uh, interconnector for Quinell. It is about the whole north. And I really appreciate the fact, first, I appreciate the fact that the Quinell Chamber of Commerce has been a very strong advocate, as has the city of Quinell. And they reached out to the Prince George uh, uh, Mayor and Council and they wrote a letter of support and now we have other communities in the north that are equally signing on and saying, look, this isn't just a project for one community. This is a project that is going to impact the supply chain for all of northern British Columbia and that is critically important. We learned during the 2017 wildfire season the significant impact when we have closures for a particular piece of time on Highway 97 and the impact that it has on both the north and the south um, economies. And having this interconnector is a much bigger project, I would say, than just our riding. It is a project that I'm encouraging all of the candidates uh, to be talking about in other ridings because I think if something happens to that bridge and we talk about that all 
all the time, uh, that is going to have an impact in the entire north. Randy, what is your view and the view of the BC Greens on the Cornell inter interconnector? Well, I, I know from a personal perspective that it's, it hasn't happened because it's not easy. There's so many factors involved. You've got the pulp mill sewage treatment pond right beside where you would be. You've got, you're going right through subdivisions and there is a lot of pre-work to do before you can even get started. But it's right, that bridge is key to the economy of the north because that's Highway 97 going across that rickety old bridge. And you're, all your trucks and everything are, it's like the, the tie up sometime, the traffic problems, the issues on Dragling Hill coming up off that bridge. It can be horrendous at times. And uh, the, also the issue of the snow in the, in the winter time, I don't know the slope of how the new approach would be, but that's a terrible road in the winter. Truck, trucks spin out on it all the time. There's so many different issues. I don't have the details of, of what the Green Party would fund as far as that particular project. I just know that it does need to be done, you know? Right. Thank you for that. Next question is for you, Coralie. We already had a bit of a discussion about mental health and addictions, but I wanted to look at it in, in, in a broader context in terms of the fact that this crisis in mental health and addictions is on top of a broader crisis of healthcare in general in this province in terms of accessibility to doctors, to wait times, surgery wait times. And so Coralie, I, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, if you're elected as an independent, how, how would you advocate for, for improved healthcare access? Yeah. I've had some um, really difficult conversations with a lot of families. And one of the pieces that people may not understand as an MLA, the role that we often play as advocating for our citizens and particularly the ones that um, really have nowhere else to go. And some of those conversations are uh, really, really challenging. And, and part of the reason, quite frankly, why, why I decided not to retire, because what I will say is whoever's elected in this, um, in this upcoming election, um, there is an enormous stack of files that we have right now about people that require access to health care in our region. And um, it is significantly challenging to navigate the bureaucracy. Uh, this riding goes from Northern Health and in into Interior Health. They both health authorities operate very, very differently. Uh, we do not get the same level of services that the Lower Mainland has. And that has got to stop. And we need to continue to raise the voices and to put the government on account for the fact that when I have colleagues and I've, you know, I, you can check out some of the speeches I've made in the House that they'll heckle and will brag about the services that they have in their communities when we can't actually get even a doctor for our constituents. Enough is enough. If you talk about equality, if you talk about equity in healthcare, you have to deliver it. And that means making sure that communities like ours get the same level of access. You can't talk about how many doctors are coming into the region and, and get and do press conferences at the same time as we have lineups in our, in our offices where nobody has a doctor, where you can't get appointments for cancer care, where you can't get an MRI, that has to stop. It has to stop. And the only way it is going to be is if we all stand up together and say, look, we deserve the same services as the lower mainland. Randy. Yes, um, going to the doctor for me is going to the emergency. I mean, that's just a reality. And it shouldn't be that everyday people are going to the emergency department because that has its own issues itself. Um, I've written about it before, Sonia has talked about it, the Dogwood model of regional wellness centers where it has doctors, it has nurses, psychiatrists, it's, it's a building. Either you build it or you take over an existing building and you have all the services that you need. You can assess people, figure out what's going on, um, figure out what's with this particular person and create a strategy. And that's what happens with a lot of the, the homeless people and the people that are just pushed to the side. There's no strategy. I mean, I think the NDP has tried to do, like if you declare you're an addict, you can get a nurse and 
some services, but a lot of people, we're just sedating them, you know, in the addiction thing. I understand safe supply and I agree with it, but our strategy needs to be move people beyond just maintaining them on drugs, getting them to the services that they need. I know it's hard when you're addicted and you enter into a recovery situation that it's not always successful. It's just the, the fact the way humans are. That's just the way we are. You know, drugs make the pain go away. And so people stay on them so they don't have to feel the pain. You have to get to the point of why are they feeling the pain? Can we alleviate that? That creates more success. And we need tons of services physically and just philosophically. Yeah. Sheldon, your views. Well, the NDP has created a health, public safety, and economic disaster in this province through their policies and actions, including safe supply, Randy. I have a number of friends who've been involved in the medical professions. I have a good friend who is a addictions counselor, and I explained to her what we were doing out here in BC, and she said to me, Sheldon, what the NDP is doing there is guaranteed to make more people addicts, to keep people addicts, and to have, see more people die. And it may not just be the people who are addicted, it may be the, the people who they are preying on to serve their addictions. So that kind of process is not something that can, can be allowed to continue, certainly not as it has been happening. It has to be stopped, and it has to be stopped firmly, resolutely, and it has to be taken into consideration with a broader look at healthcare generally to see why we are losing doctors in the north. I reliably told we're losing seven doctors just in the Quinell area this, this next year. That's terrible. That, and I mean, someone in the lower mainland will say, oh, seven doctors, that's nothing. Well, seven doctors in a community the size of Quinell that has a very important regional responsibility for the many smaller communities around it is a huge hit. And I, I have great sympathy for my colleague Randy, who, who does, is having to go to the emergency department to, to get, a, a, get a, a medical appointment. It's unheard of in many jurisdictions in the world. I've been to places like Europe and, and had a need to go see a doctor. I went in, they had no appointment, walked in, sat down, saw a physician, had the issue dealt with, and I was out the door. I couldn't believe it. I thought, wow. And Canada thinks it has the best health care system in the world? We really have to engage with our, our federal counterparts and the, and the province to make sure that what we're doing is going to adequately and directly serve the people who have been paying their taxes their whole lives and to, that they get the support they deserve and need. Thank you, Sheldon, for that response. We'll be back after this quick break. One more question for each of our candidates and then we'll give them each an opportunity to provide a closing statement. The last question, we'll start with you, Randy. Yes. Consumers and business owners are feeling the pain of rising living and operating costs, partly because government has added more regulations and higher taxes. What are you and your party planning to do to reduce these costs? There is so much corporate involvement in every level of business. And if we can somehow try to decorporatize things a little bit, I'm a big believer in co-ops. Uh, if you have local economies and community economies so that people are staying within their community and doing things that, you know, the local thing, and that's all fine, but it really does mean something. Uh, Green Party's big on small business for having people doing their own things. A lot of corporate interests want to buy up everything and control everything. The whole world is controlled by just a few companies and they're everything, PepsiCo and Boeing and everything else is owned by just a few people. And that's the recipe for disaster because we lose control of our own things. Look at COVID, no toilet paper, no flour, no nothing, because we're dependent on a supply chain that is controlled by others. And again, being so far apart when you're in cities that are distanced away, uh, you just don't have a chance to make your own decisions. If you have local businesses that can feed the local people, uh, you gain much more control over your community. Sheldon, your thoughts on rising costs? 
Well, businesses and even small businesses, large businesses, have been subjected to all sorts of problems. And I don't think it matters how big the business is. I mean, I was out at uh, one of the major mills talking to the owners out there, and I said, well, you know, if there were two or three things that we could actually do something to fix, what would it be? And it was, they basically boiled down to getting the bureaucracy moving a little more quickly to make sure we have due access to fiber supply, get rid of the, the uh, permit, get the permitting process moving along, and make sure that, uh, that we are coming up with a really serious look at how we do stumpage and revenue sharing. And the Conservative Party of BC has put out a platform about forestry and stumpage recently where we want to eliminate stumpage. And there's going to be a lot of discussion by that when we're in the legislature talking about it to see how that would actually work. However, smaller businesses talk to me about things like being able to find people who can actually work, who don't have high expectations for massive wages right off the bat, and expect minimal, tr minimal training and just want to show up when they can show up. There's a real shift needed in discipline around work and how people approach work and also a need to cut back on the red tape and the bureaucracy that make it difficult for business owners to do what they do best and get their products and services to market. It's a very important aspect of making sure that this province becomes a place where everyone can prosper. Corley. Yeah, 97% um, of small businesses have recently talked about their cost of in the cr increase in the past five years. 39% um, wonder if they can remain viable uh, in the next uh, year, 52% in the next uh, four years. All of this speaks to the fact that we've had 52 uh, new or increased pieces of uh, taxes that have been layered by the NDP government that is just strictly um, uh, on top of all of the red tape that they've added to just make it that it's not affordable to operate a business anymore. What do we want our communities to look like? If we want to make sure that we have a healthy small business sector, if we want to make sure that we have healthy downtowns, we better be understanding that direct correlation to increasing red tape, increasing taxes, and the impact it has on our communities. As far as the natural resource sector, there needs to be uh, certainty, there needs to be a reduction in permitting. Look, all of us know people in fact, probably a significant majority of the people in our region work in the natural resource sector. We're proud of working in the natural resource sector. We're worried about what is happening uh, under this NDP government with driving business out of the province of British Columbia, all very alarming. And um, points that I think that um, I am confident that having um, some ability to hold governments to account that we'll be able to see a, a, a change in direction for sure by ensuring that the NDP do not get re-elected. Going to go now to closing statements. I'll give each of you about a minute to uh, make your, your last pitch to the voters of Prince George North Caribou about why they should put an X beside uh, your name on the ballot on October 19th, and we'll start with you, Sheldon. Well, first of all, Neil, I'd like to thank you and the Prince George Chamber of Commerce for running this event. I've enjoyed it immensely, and I think it's valuable, and I thank CKPG for being the, uh, the means and the media to put it out. Well, why should they vote for us? Why, why, why are we the best choice? Well, I think we're all in an agreement that the NDP needs to lose this election. And right now, the Conservative Party of British Columbia is poised to be that new government. We have excellent candidates coming from a wide variety of backgrounds. We are serious individuals with a variety of experiences. We know education, we know healthcare, we know business. We know a lot about our provinces and our, our province and our, our communities. And I think we have a tremendous amount to offer and we represent significant change from what's been going on for the last 30 or 40 years. There are certainly people in our, our party who have got some experience, who have gone from other parties to come and work with us. I think of Mahoney, and, who was an N NDP MLA, and of course the, 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 those who were with the BC Liberals, BC United, who have come over to join us. And I think what I have found in my conversations with some of our, our new loyalists, our new, our, our new members, is that they share the same values and views for a prosperous British Columbia, in which everybody is going to have access to, to a doctor at some level that they can get that get that help they need and that we're going to see some quality education and quality health care and opportunities for business to get everything moving. This is all interrelated. It's all interconnected and you can't just address one problem and you say this problem, we fix this, but we still have all these other problems because 
it's, it's a web and it's all connected and you have to deal with everything. It's going to be expensive and we're going to have to do some things that are going to be painful in the short term, but I'm sure we're going to make this a better province when we're government. And I look forward to discussing a transition plan much like Bob Simpson did with you when he was an independent back in 2013, Coralie. Coralie, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Neil. Thank you for the work that you are doing in the Chambers of Commerce, actually throughout the region, because I know CKPG reaches a large audience, and I just want to thank everyone uh, for volunteering and the work that the business community does uh, and the executive uh, team. Um, I'm asking for your support um, on October 19th or earlier. You know, you can vote in advance voting. And I think there are two things I think to consider when you are sitting at that kitchen table with your family and you're discussing um, what matters to you and what you should be looking at in the next election. The first thing is change isn't going to happen overnight. And I know the amount of files that we currently have and are helping people, whether it's navigating the healthcare system, whether it's transportation or whether it's other issues that are happening to you and you've come to our office for help. Continuity matters. And my commitment to you, I have an incredible team that will continue to help you make sure that you get the services and the supports that you need. The second thing I will say, I think that we are going to see a very close election. And at this time, you have the opportunity to have your voice play a very unique role in what will be an exciting time in BC politics. Corley Oaks could be your independent voice that has the ability to have the balance of power in making decisions to ensuring that Parliament moves smoothly, that Parliament moves forward, that this party backfighting between the two, um, that doesn't make sure anything goes forward, that an independent can have that reasonableness, that experienced voice at the table to make sure things move forward. And finally, you know me. And for people in the Prince George area, I look forward to getting out and talking with you and hearing about what your issues are. Um, I've worked here for a long time. I hope that um, I've earned your trust. Please know I will always work hard. I am somebody full of integrity. I love the region. And above all, um, it has truly been an honor to have the privilege to serve as your MLA for over a decade. Randy, final word to you. On that note, hey, you know me. I'm the garlic guy. Um, I'm, a sm <laughs> I'm a small business owner. I own and operate Oddball Garlic Company. It's not a commercial, but I understand business, taking a raw product, garlic, and turning it into a viable retail product that you get um, the retail from. I was originally producing product and wholesaling, and it just the store made more money than I did, and it was a recipe for disaster. Uh, you may have seen me shake my head and smile when my conservative colleague uh, brought up dropping and eliminating stumpage fees. Uh, there's a great myth in forestry, and, and I know that BC has had forestry as part of the economy for a very long time. We used to be a province of old growth trees. We are not anymore. There's hardly any left. The quality of our wood has degraded greatly because we just don't have the big trees like we used to. It used to be easy to cut really clean lumber. But the myth of forestry is with stumpage fees and forestry taxes coming to the province and the GDP of $5 billion, that sounds good, but that's not coming to the province. That's product sold out, to the, out, of, the, out of the province, and that goes to corporations. We get like 1.4 or something in GDP, billion in, uh, in stumpage fees and, and forest taxes. And with the subsidies, the massive amount of subsidies that is given to the forest industry, we literally lose money from forestry. It doesn't fund anything. It's, it's a myth that people go, oh, that's crazy, that's not right. No, that's true. I applaud David Brodlin and his work in bringing these facts forward. He wrote a piece, uh, Forestry Definitely Doesn't Pay the Bills, Folks. And there's myths that people believe. Again, it's like politics, like a religion. If you believe it, it's true for you. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's based in fact. Thank you, Randy. And that concludes our election special. And I'd like to thank all three of you from Prince, vying for uh, the candidacy and to win the election in Prince George North Caribou. 
all the best uh, out there on the, on the trail. Uh, Thank you, Neil. Sheldon Clare with Appreciate the BC it. Conservatives, Cora Lee. Good luck, Cora Lee. Cora Lee Oaks is Randy an independent yes, candidate. Thank you, too. And, 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 and thank Randy you again Green. To CKPG. Yeah, Sorry thank you. For, so th thank you for doing this. I'm Neil Godbu. I am the executive director of the Prince George Chamber of Commerce. Good night. <laughs>